Welcome to this episode of The Sit Down. Today we are joined by Stephen Gillen. Stephen spent part of his childhood in a war zone and was one of the most feared gangsters in London's East End. He spent multiple years in different prisons, which included maximum security facilities. He's now the author of The Monkey Puzzle Tree, a book about his life, which is being made into a Hollywood movie. He's also been awarded um, a Peace Ambassador Prize. He's a business consultant and a charity volunteer driving change. Thank you very much for joining us today, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Michael. Really, thank you. So your story through my time researching is fascinating. It pulls on my emotions. It uh, gives me fear, um, brings me happiness. Um, and at times also made me laugh as, as well uh, along the way. You, let's start at the beginning. You grew up in ultimately a war zone during the war in Ireland. What was that like as a child? It, it was a magical experience for me as a, as a child. You know, the family around me, immediate family, they was wonderful people. It was quite normal, you know, in a sense then you know through the eyes of a child um but you know i would see a lot of violence and different stuff going on obviously a lot of activity riots shooting but you know through the through the eyes of a child then you think this is normal so looking back now do you do you recall any events from your time in ireland that maybe started the path that you were you were going to lead that would have affected you mentally or impacted your childhood without realising it at the time? Looking back, because of the environment of the times, it was a kind of a place, the Irish are wonderful people, this is the first thing, they really are the salt of the earth. The division there was hard, you know, and really, really unfortunate, you know, because, you know, it's all the same people. But because of the divisions, you know, you had to watch what you said, who you talked to, who was listening, where you went, all these kind of things. Everyone was mindful of stuff like that, you know, and of course there was the army presence and, you know, there was all the violence and riots and checkpoints and things like that. When I started reading your book, the part in which you talk about the young man that was shot in front of you, um, and ultimately died in front of you, held me in the room at the time I was reading it, um, trying to imagine what it was like to to witness that. What what impact did that have on you, or has that had on you? This was massive, it really was. I mean, at the time, you know, it was terrifying, you know, for me or a child. It wiped me out, you know, emotionally as a child to have to witness something like that. I think the hardest part was having to stay there while, while he was dying and, um, you know, he's calling for his mother. That was traumatic, you know, it really was. And um, to the point it stayed with me for many, many years, you know, and this in particular was one of them things that I locked away, you know. I didn't, I didn't speak of this, certainly not in any detail to anyone throughout my life till six seven years ago you've also said and this is also um, a line from your book where you say that recalling your story um for for writing the book is like galloping through hell on horseback is that the sort of experience that you're referring to when when you you say that yeah i kind of was involved in violence even by proxy you know from these kind of kinds of incidences but what I seem to do with my life is because I was cast out in many ways you know and had to had to had to fend for myself you know and you know I made a lot of bad choices you know I didn't have have the knowledge then uh, it is what it is but I kept compounding that and um you know I I I got involved in serious crime with serious people very very early on so this was a real pattern for me for most of my life you know until until my transformation what what age what age did you start committing crime and what sort of crimes were you committing when you first started <sighs> very early you know i mean you're talking 11 silly things like 
you know, theft, stealing cars, getting chases from the police and all this kind of stuff, Michael. And recalling that back during that time, was it something that you, was it an adrenaline rush? Was it was it kind of um, reaching out for help? Was it a cry for help? What, what do you think is the purpose? Looking back, I think it was both. You know, it was certainly the adrenaline rush of a young, of a young youth and a young man, the excitement of it, of course. But really, behind all this stuff, you know, even, you know, I'm always looking at what's behind, you know, what's the real stuff, you know, and it was certainly, I was, I was very lost even at that point. So there was a, you know, I was looking for direction, you know, the right instruction. You know, I was looking for so much, which I, you know, I didn't, didn't, didn't have at that point point in my life certainly for a long time to come yeah you eventually moved back to england didn't you after your um as uh, auntie madge passed away who she raised you right yeah and when you moved back there um did you fall straight back into the same problems where you were kind of committing petty crime as a youngster you have to you have to remember i was different you know i spoke funny so you know i was different i stuck out i was a target but I was popular in a sense, you know. You know, I mean, obviously, I I had my problems with that. But I, um, my answer, you know, was to do more and be more. You know, you have to think of the environment I come from was really different. So I was shaped really, really different anyway. So I always seemed to be more, even even than the children around me. Then have a have have a, have a much bigger. Uh, bandwidth, Michael. So, so it sounds like your focus was on survival, whether it be social, whether it be mental, whether it be for acceptance. And in, in, in any in any case, it sounds like survival was important to you. Was drugs ever a part of your childhood? Unfortunately, yeah. Um, I ha I had addiction problems. You know, addiction problems. They exhibit themselves very, very early. They certainly did in my case. It was another another layer of that feeling different from everyone else. You hear this from people who, you know, have had these problems on their journey. You know, I'm 11 years clean now, you know, of absolutely everything. And, um, you know, I'm very happy to say I've done a lot of work as a sponsor and yeah, helping people to save their life also in this area. But the reality of going through something like that for so long is horrendous and not many people come back from it, Michael, unfortunately. So when you were young, you were sent to um, what would probably now be known as a, a, a juvenile jail, essentially, in Borstal. Um what was it you were sent there for? And what was that experience like as a child? Because some of the stories I've heard are. Yeah, um, I went to send. It, it was detention centre then, which was a short, sharp shop. So it was basically like signing up to an army camp. Everywhere was on the double. It was marching. It was, you know, all the people there was ex, ex forces. This was the, this was the focus there. And, um, it was very violent, you know. It, kids of that age can you know, can be a lot worse than adults in adults' prisons. Um, some of the people I was there with you know, would become very, very notorious later on, and I would go all the way through the prison system with them. You know, they'd be involved in the Tottenham riots and stuff like that. I mean, you know, some of the really, really notorious people of the time. Um, they used to make us do mad things, Michael, like, you know, go out and... There was a corridor there. It was called the M1 for obvious reasons, you know, with these tiles, and they'd get us scrubbing that with a toothbrush. Lots of stuff like this. Yeah, that's a lot of work. Well, it, you know, you know, they'd done this for a reason. It was about discipline and, you know, all of this stuff. Yeah. So, so when you um, got a bit older, started you started getting involved in more kind of heavy, serious, organised crime, didn't you? Yeah. What sort of crimes were you and your gang involved in? It was very, it was very organised. You know, it could be anything. It was mainly uh, heavy stuff to do with guns. You know, there was protection. You know, protection rackets, loads of racket. Any rackets that would make money, Michael. But of a certain certain level, uh, you know, geared by armed robbery, geared by heavy violence, guns. You know, all of this stuff. 
Um, and to a high level, it would have to be there'd have to be the money in it, you know, and you'd have to be doing it with the right level of people. So, you must have been making quite a lot of money back then. The truth is, Michael, in this life, yeah, you do. But you know, it's the kind of the life where one day you've got a fortune, the next day you're potless. That's the reality of it. You know, it really is. So it's up and down. But you, you see, the thing about that kind of money is in that life is you go through so much money. But the very energy of money, because money is an energy and how you're getting it, it doesn't stay with you in that right way because it's not, I mean, it's easy come, easy go, that life, very treacherous life. But even the energy of the money, you don't seem to be able to hold on to it. Or the ones that do, you, you know, they don't seem to have a good time with, with it. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to fast forward to uh, the day that you were arrested that would ultimately lead in a rather large sentence. Um, does that day still play back in your head, the day you were caught? It does. But, you know, I've got to be honest. My life was so populated with instances like this. There were so many instances like this. And that, although it's very climatic and it's it's it was a a milestone in my life. My life was littered with times like that. You know, I mean, I would walk into places pretty much on a daily basis, you know, in that life, you know, and I walk into places and we wouldn't know if we was walking out. We really wouldn't. Looking back, it's, you know, it's crazy madness. But this was, you know, the galloping through hell on horseback thing. You know, it was like you would actually chase it. You would actually pursue it, pursue it to that, to that point. The violence, the risk, the the getting in the middle of this stuff. What what was it that you were you, you and your group were on your way to do when you were um, arrested? Was that another robbery? It was it was a robbery, you know. And in them days, there was collections, loose collections of robbers, you know, who would work with each other. Organised crime in many ways is the same all over, Michael. It really is, you know. It's loosely connected, or it's very regimented, but it's the same stuff. You know, we would we would we would move and rob on any anything that moved, really. You know, anything that moved. You know, jewelry shops, uh, vans, um, wages. Um, you know, anything that that was that was fair game. When you, much like anything, that you know, it doesn't it doesn't even need to be a crime with most people. When you think back, and 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 you know, you kind of go through some of these stories in your head and and think about what happened. Do you view it from like a third person, so yourself is like a totally different human being, because obviously you are different now, um, and how do you kind of deal with the the guilt and regret of the people that were impacted by it? Because that must be quite a tough journey to go through. That's a very good question, Michael, you know, and um, the truth of it is, is, yeah, there are epiphanies. Yes, there are eureka moments, but this is a process. This is not, I go to bed one night like that and I wake up in the morning, this different person. For human beings, it's a internal journey anyway of many things, you know, we know this. You know, and the first person we have to deal with and work with is us. You know, this is the thing. So, you know, I had to do a lot of work and, you know, I had to exercise a lot of demons, which is an interesting thing because... I think for all, none of us are perfect, you know, we all make mistakes, but I think in certain ways, the way we're woven sometimes for many reasons is we can never really completely exercise some of these demons, but we can certainly rise above them in such a way that they're contained and bolted behind really locked doors that, that I mean, you can't cut away part of yourself, can you? I mean, let's face it. So for me, I had to, you know, I call it internal engineering because it really was. Along the journey of the metamorphosis of the person I am today was a lot of work. It was a lot of work over a lot of years of doing the right thing. And yeah, you know, I had done a lot of internal work. I had a lot of help with that along the way. And But it's about doing, you know, if you want to, be be honourable, do honourable things. 
You know, if you want to be strong, be with strong people. If you want to be successful, hang out with successful people. Do what successful people do. So, you know, and it's about um, consistency, you know, as well. So, you know, I had to fortify myself with the right values, which is why I am so have so clear ideas now because of my history about ways of behaviour and different things like that. But so I just add to that framework only the good stuff. So it keeps bad or unhealthy people, places and things out, very regimented. And it holds some stuff in too as well. But it's made me into a very measured person. Forged in a unique way with a lot of unique kind of skills. But I'm so much there and I'm very happy. I'm very, what you see today is what you see today. Yeah. It's just a fascinating thing that people think, well, how is that possible from that? To that, it's two extremes. What's the middle bit? That's a good answer, you know, for to describe yeah. Yeah. some of the middle bit. Do you find that you have to spend longer considering decisions than, you know, most normal people would because of your past and because of the decisions you've made in your past? Do you have to be more calculated to keep on the right track? At the start... You know, going back some years when I was finding my way back to myself, yes, it, you know, I would have been more mindful of always going down the correct path, choosing the right decisions. But that works now in the other way. That's another reason why, you know, I can be so good at what I do because I have them answers like that now. Yeah, It's variables to me. It's like an algorithm. I've had so much, I can pull it up and I have the answer. You know, and it's a lot to yeah. do with people and managing people, you know, it's, stuff it, like that. It sounds, it's, it's, it's very much like a muscle, I guess. So the more you exercise the process of understanding the, the, the right thing to do, um, the best thing to do, the, the easier that process internally becomes to get to that answer. Um, so it it sounds like you've, you've, you've obviously done a lot of that. You were, how long were you sentenced for in total? We got 69 years, Michael, and, you know, it was lots of firearms charges. I mean, I went to the Old Bailey on trial three times for armed robbery. The first one, I was found not guilty. The second one, I was found not guilty, but I was found guilty of possession of a firearm. And the third time is where we got the 69 years, which, you know, was all different offences because there were shots fired at police and all this kind of stuff. And it, um, but it, run, it runs concurrently. You know, so it was 14 years, 14 years. I'd done 11 years and nine months out of it, every day of it, a Category A prisoner. I was released Category A. So Category A, for, for any viewers that, that don't understand, and you're definitely better than me to explain this, is, is very much um, security. You know, there's a, there's a tight you know, rope around you at all times, really, isn't there, being a Category A prisoner? The definition of a category of prison is still the same now, Michael, is someone is highly dangerous to the public, the police or the security of the state and whose escape must be made impossible. So it's very security. I mean, even when you're moved around the prison, you have a book with a, with a photo. This is why they call it on the book. And anywhere, if you're transferred, you know, they sign you over. Yeah. Like a parcel, Michael, right? But it's very... You know, they've been doing this a long time, obviously, the prison system. So they have systems that are very, but it's a, it's a different way of doing prison from the general population. And, you know, even for me, as the, even amongst the cat A's, what I was, was even worse because there's some of the, there's different levels of category A, the standard, in hard, uh, uh, high risk, exceptional risk. So why done a lot of my prison, even uh, in, Prison within prisons. Do you, from your experience, do you think prison helps the individual that's in there? I think um, pr prison could be made a lot better in many ways. There are certainly some people who certainly need to be in prison, Michael. But there are a lot of people who are many strong in prison and some who shouldn't be in prison at all. You met many people in prison. Um, the most famous, and you've spoke about this quite a lot, is um, Charles Bronson. Um, there's mixed, you know, I, I hear mixed things about him. There's the things you read in the media, and then there's the things you hear from the people that know him. 
is is he a classic example of someone that could that, that very well could have been rehabilitated but might not have the opportunity to actually use it absolutely you know to, uh, me certainly i was very very misunderstood i think we are as human beings many of us i mean that's a fact right charlie is a typical typical example of that i mean knowing charlie as a friend and um <laughs> he has a wonderful side to him, Charlie, you know, he really does. But he's been positioned, you know, the way the Home Office do this, they do it on purpose to some to some prisoners. He's been positioned to so they can really do what they want with him. That's the truth. What was your day like the day that you were released? What was that feeling like? <laughs> It was wonderful. I've got a story about the day I was released, which isn't exclusive and people don't know. But on the day that I was meant to be released as a cat A from Belmarsh, I was meant to go in the morning because I was still a category A, which is not normal, you know, to be released like that. I was meant to go in the morning, but they made this big thing up with the governors and all that saying I had to. There was something in the sentence and I had to do another 30 days or something. But actually it was a pure lies just to hold me so they actually let me go in the evening but they had uh, a surveillance squad outside the prison so i actually this is why they was holding me back right you know because they was organizing you know, the operation outside yeah. so they give me all these lies so i kind of come out to that which was very very unfortunate because i it was surreal because i'd come through one door and i'd come out another 12 years of my life of absolute hell, you know, unbelievable darkness, violence and hell and torture had just gone, but it was like that didn't exist. And I was thrown straight back into this technological surveillance war. What chance did I really have really at that point, looking back, you know? Yeah, I guess there would have been hope that you would have been able to feel a little bit more human when you were get, going to get out in some regards, and um, that must have felt like it was taken away from you in, in some cases. Yeah. What was the day like when you actually got out and left? Was it, did you decide at that point that, you know, I'm going to change my life? Had that decision already been made um, while you were in prison, or did that happen after you were released? I, um, you know, the truth is <clears throat> it takes years to actually um feel a sentence like that to get into it for it to hit you but on the other side of a sentence like that it takes years because you're institutionalized michael you come out everything's fast i mean i was so strong mentally and emotionally but i was you know really in a bad way you know because of what i'd been through and um you know anger violence has drove me for so long as a protection mechanism survival mechanism you know in that sentence you can't just eradicate that stuff straight away and you know change change worlds like that so there was a lot of difficulties there as there is for prisoners to come out to settle you know i certainly had that but you know of course it was different for me because i was a category a i was a target criminal i come straight out to all the same stuff again you know i went back to bethnal green and you know i was traveling a lot and different stuff you know i was going to europe and different stuff but i um you know i got involved again and you know i was arrested with a firearm again and that was the last time i went you know i went back you know i had this for protection and different stuff because I was involved again with different stuff, you know, and that was that. And I got five years, you know, and this was the time after that. So I went back again as a category. You imagine that? I mean, this is unbelievable. But after that, this was this was the last time, uh, Michael. Do you find to this day, do you still have to be careful of maybe where you're going or who's in the room um, because of your history? Are there people that hold <sighs> grudges? Look, there's always people who hold grudges, Michael. You know, human beings are like that. Do I, you know, am I mindful? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm ingrained of being mindful anyway. People should be, you know, am I? But, you know, I never done any, any harm to anyone in that life in a bad way. You know, I always played by the rules. People know that. You don't get on with everyone anyway. It is what it is. But I done my prison and 10 other peoples with it. 
You know, I really done it, and I done the whole lot of it. And I know many who didn't even didn't even do half of it, not a quarter. You know, of what I done. Them days, you know, it's over. It's a closed book. You know, I'm very privileged and very happy. You know, I had the strength, I had the courage, I had the opportunity, all of this to evolve myself as a human being. But go back to what I really was. You know, Michael, it's not that I changed into this magical, magical person. It's I had the courage to find my way back to myself. I always had a good heart. You know, I had good people around me. I had to deal with a lot of issues. So, and, you know, I've gone on to do much, much work and I'm led by goodness. So it is what it is, Michael. Really. How, how do you go from that life to receiving a peace prize. That's a long, they are opposite ends of the stick, literally. They are. And you know what I would say is, you know, you have to remember that I wasn't on the floor. I was 10 foot under it. This is important to remember. So I wasn't starting at the traps. I wasn't starting at square one. I was starting 10 steps behind that, literally. So you're talking about really baby steps, even sometimes not even knowing what or where you're going, but knowing you're doing the right thing and you're going in the right direction. But small steps turn into great strides, Michael, is the best way to, to, you know, to say it. When you say that you were starting behind the, you weren't starting at square one, do you feel that that is actually a problem for, for many people who are born into to poverty? that have to be put into positions without their, their choice where life is very difficult for them and they're starting. Do you think that is actually a problem with <clears throat> with crime where poverty is not addressed and it, it's more focused on fighting crime rather than helping those who need it? Look, you know, it is about opportunity. But you see, the thing is that, look, as human beings, we're fused with a lot of different desires and wants and what we see and baggage, all of this kind of stuff. But the traps and the levels are the same for all of us. This is important just to narrow it. So these traps are there. But look, you know, it is about you really need to be unique. You know, you really need. I mean, the first person you need to be dealing with is yourself. You know, I mean, we train people, I train entrepreneurs now, I've come all of that journey, Michael, and I can tell you, the main block to anyone's success or being happier or being more peaceful or being more joyous or getting the stuff they want or going forward is that they can't get out of their own way. I want you to think about that for a moment because it seems very easy, but in reality, it's not. Now, this is the first step about managing us, not an easy thing. But you know, when we do that, we're already really, really ahead of the game because the mindset will change and the development will change. So now the energies are right and you will see you will expedite a lot more quickly and surely what you want. So that's a good, that's a good way to start. So that, that, that moves us on very well, actually, to, to the work that you're doing now. So we obviously have the book, The Monkey Puzzle Tree, which I believe that sold out very quickly. You've read it, right, Michael? Yes, I have, yes. Oh, thanks. Thanks for reading it. Well, it's, thank you for sending it. Oh, look, it's my pleasure. And you know this book, I'm so privileged that um, I started writing in prison. You know, this is where I started that writing journey. Mm -hmm. But it is all these years to come to this level as a writer, obviously, and everything else, you know, with a, with a depth of wisdom about life and all of this stuff, right? So um, it's selling out all over the world, it really is, because um, it's a very human story. It's a very brave story. I don't go around the houses with it, Michael. I don't cut no corners. I mean, I've had to be mindful and protective to people, places and things, you know, for obvious reasons. So we've changed some names and some stuff around. Sure. But I kept to the authenticity of that because I read so many books and see so many films. And I thought, yeah, OK, it's OK for a kind of a, you know, a book or a film, something to watch. But it in no way really shows you what goes on, you know, in this life. Or certainly the lessons, the lessons, the real lessons about what to do and certainly what not to do. Yeah, I, I must admit. And, uh, you know, so many people will think I'm simply seeing this because we're here talking. But, uh, and I said this to you before the interview, that 
it did not take long for me to have to hold my emotions in check reading that book. Um, very quickly did I have to, you know, hold hold them in um, because it it's raw and it really put me there in the story. Um, it was almost like I was a fly on the wall watching. So, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, okay. And it certainly does feel like a real genuine experience for me as the reader to get a look into that life, but also learn the lessons from them without having to go through it, which I think is fantastic. The, the book itself is obviously doing very well, and I don't know how much you can or can't speak about this, but, I mean, is it 100% being made in a movie? Is it hush-hush, you know? There's, there's so, uh, there was so much in the press about this, as you know, Michael. Widespread national press, global press, um, constantly, you know, about this. I can say we have the script. You know, the screenplay has been has been written. It is 100% being made into a movie. You can say that. There are, you know, there's a lot of provenance out there now because we can populate more content now and get more people and show a bit more as we go along this journey. Yes. So we're starting to reveal more now what we're doing, where we are, you know, and all that with this process. So there's stuff out there for people. But we, you know, we're really um with some very and certainly talking to some very very influential and known names i can't say too much about that the press has been leaking names tom harley yeah i've seen that one yeah <laughs> christian bale and look you know uh what i can say is they are names of that caliber certainly and you know at that level and below you know or whatever it's immense work to make a film like this yeah it's you know it's a it's a it's a big budget movie and um it's a wonderful story to be told you know i mean i'm you know i'm very privileged obviously it's it's quite a journey but it's not what people would think and for me it, it's different when they're talking about you michael it is like the third person is, you know, you you kind of detach from it in a way because I'm a very grounded person, but that's the best way to be because I'd never be where I was if I wasn't, Michael. Yeah. You know, yeah, my yeah. head doesn't yeah. get turned by nonsense or anything like that. I'm, you know, I'm very, very hardworking. I'm, you know, I'm very normal. I'm very grounded, but I'm very courageous as well at f completing tasks and being very shrewd with the wonderful people I have in my life. So, you know, this is key, you know, and I'm very, I'm very humble to, you know, you know, in many ways. So I see so much, I see so much, but I want so much for it to do so much good. Yeah. So this is really what it's about for me. Do you think it will be difficult to, because undoubtedly you'll be on set as a consultant, as, as you know, I'm a producer. Yeah, oh, I'm a well, producer. You yeah. Do you, think, is, yeah. do you think it will be difficult to watch the actors play out certain scenes that are your memories that may be painful i th that's a good question my my feeling is i've done so much certainly even with the book the book was very cathartic michael to write the book but it's like the more we do on things it does dilute it slightly because <coughs> the greater purpose of what we're involved in and the momentum we're getting so much traction at improving people's lives around the world becomes so much more incumbent upon you. And, you know, I'm very happy for that because the past is the past. It's very important, the present, and certainly where we're going, you know, where we're going. We need to be going in the right direction. And um, I love the creative uh, experience of it all and the wonderful people of course I get to work with so it's like everyone is trying to do such a good job Michael yeah, to get yeah. it right so it's a immense task but we're very up for it and we have the people to do it so we will do it <laughs> fantastic how many tickets do you think you'll get for friends and family at the premiere <laughs> I'm just wondering. <laughs> but you know what, Mama? This, right, you see questions like that. <clears throat> I don't think of this stuff. No. I mean, the people thought that I thought, oh, you know, I really don't. My head, yeah, I don't come from that angle. It's a great question. I'm just interested if there's one spare. You know, <laughs> I'd love you to be there, Michael. You know, you're a wonderful guy. You really are. But look, I don't think of these things. In more, I, I have much more important yeah. things yeah. that my heart is taken to. 
And I, you know, I do what's right. I don't need to do anything else. I, I, it's really easy in that way, you know. I'm not going to do something I don't believe in, or, or or do something that's not right. That I don't. That's not me. I'm not that guy. Well, you're starting the Stephen Gillen Foundation. Is is that very much what that is about? Do, helping people to do the right thing. <laughs> There's a lot going on with this. There really is. There's immense work, again, behind this. And there are very influential figures, really. Politicians, community leaders, celebrities, media, business people. But it's interesting because in our lives now, there are so so many people who are change makers but are really influential in what they do. So all of this collectively coming together... I think because of the times as well that we're in globally, certainly in this country with COVID, you know, and all this stuff, there's a lot of fear about people are really suffering, bless them. You know, uh, the future is really, really uncertain. Now for us, you know, as business strategists and humanitarians and the people we are for what we really believe in is... For us, it's about putting their skills forward to, because we've got some times coming. So it, it, it's a lot about positioning to do the real good that we know that needs to be done. You, you've already done a lot of good and worked with some very important people on important matters. Were you not, were you not flown to New York to help the American, ultimately the American government deal with a problem they had they they say this right you know but the truth was i was meant to and then because of certain things that didn't actually happen okay but i do mix in these circles with you know i do mix mix in these circles certainly in in the humanitarian realm so these things are very very a lot of things have changed with covid yeah. how things are done there michael really and this is another but look you know we've certainly been involved in global 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 projects at that level for a while trying to use our resources and skills with other like-minded people to do stuff we believe in yeah with everything you're doing today all of the work um which seems like a lot of work what's your objective what what are you what, what are you moving towards and what do you hope to achieve with, with the work that you're doing today? It's always to improve people's lives. I mean, if we go back a bit, you know, at the start of my transformation, when I, well, you know, I was doing charity work, I was going into prisons, I was doing what I could, you know, I was rehabilitating myself, Michael. You know, I was doing all the things that, that, that I could, you know, to improve my life as well as a human being. I, you know, at that point, I I wanted to improve hundreds of millions of lives uh, around the world. At that point, I didn't even know how you uh, how that would happen, what that would look like, what kind of a person. But then more is revealed in life when you, you really commit yourself and apply yourself. So, you know, we knew you had to be very, very skilled in business and, you know, have them skills, certainly the media, you know, and all the wonderful contacts and different stuff. So it's just forging forward and certainly with the wonderful people I have in my life. This, it's not just me. This is, you know, the wonderful people I have in my life as well, like Daphne and there, there are so many. They know who they are. Okay. In terms of um, the actual work the foundation's going to be doing, I mean, I, I would imagine that also depends on other people that are getting involved. Is it open to people who can help to get involved and, and, and offer their support as well? Certainly it is. It's three three initiatives, which I'll say because it's very important, Michael. One is to educate and support and empower disadvantaged youth. Now, this is something, you know, you read the book. I've been through this. Yeah, this yeah. is a root cause, right? The second one is, it's the same thing, is to educate support support being the word and empower single parent families but that is about to make the you know the family key again the family unit to help this is a route you know we're really losing so much of this and the third thing is entrepreneurship you know to promote it and all this stuff because look you know it saved my life and it enables people michael from any uh, uh color history education to um to forge the skills to take their destinies in their own hands. 
in a healthy, honest way. Now, you know, when they do that, then, you know, they take other people on and that opens up more opportunity. It feeds the economy. It lets people feed their families. It, you know, it gives them self-worth. These three things under the sun are very, very key. But look, you know, what we're doing is we're, we've, we've talked and are talking to a lot of community leaders who are actually doing this stuff. We've been doing it for a long time. Certain key people. We want people who believe in what they're doing and the right people. It's a real skill to get these right people, Michael. But we're open to all these right people and all these different groups, be they NGOs or whatever, to work with us on different initiatives to really make it happen. So that's anyone out there who wants to, who wants to get involved, certainly contact us. So what we'll do is I'll speak to you and ensure the correct information is put in the description of this video so that they can they can reach out if they want to work with you or also get involved in the foundation. Um, do you think that one of the problems um, is that the, those with influence are often quite far away from the reality of the problem, that they maybe haven't lived it and that that's also why, and this is my opinion, mm. that's why having people like yourself who understand not only the problem but the people uh, the culture, um, the challenges they face. Um, and that's why it's so important to have those who have lived it involved. Um, th that to me is, a, uh, you know, it's good that, that you can get involved, but that to me is also a problem that the people who hold the power that can make change are so far away from these issues and that it takes someone like you and this foundation to bring them in to, to work towards solutions. Absolutely. Look, you know, one of the things I get told so many, uh, so many times by some really, really influential people, and they see it because they're shrewd and, and they're good people, is that look, first people have to identify with people yeah. who, who have done it, you know, who have solved the problems, who are just like them. They're not in this ivory tower or anything like that. You know, you have to be approachable, you have to be the real thing. You know, there has to be a real communication here you know that works and then actions that are followed up that, that that are the right actions right you know in a simple way so certainly now people have lost faith in so much yeah you know these institutions and all that they've made a real hash of so much normal people on the street bless them you, you know we need support as human beings timing is important and that we do it together with the right specialist help with a good heart is important so this is where we're coming from and it's immense work but look you know i always say you know and this is really true you know are we here to have nice cars and this and that yes it's lovely that we have them and we work for them there's no problem but is this really the legacy is this we're only borrowing this stuff anyway, really. Yeah. I mean, where do we go at the end of that? This is what I want people to think about. What do we actually do at the end? What is the legacy? What is the whole meaning of all of this stuff that we've done? You know, surely, you know, there can be nothing better than that we've done something to help as many people as possible on their journey. This is what is very, very apparent to me and the people in my life too. You know, it's what's important. It's what's, Absolutely. it's what's important. Do you think that criminalizing addicts is the best solution to help them? It's a very unfortunate problem. Having been there, it's like it's like exercising an evil spirit. Really, this is a very in-depth thing, and it's 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 seen as a condition and a and a disease. And it is. It's it's such a internalized thing. It's so destructive. It destroys everything it touches. It takes everyone. Prince or but it, it does not matter what level you are or what you do. Yeah. Man or woman, it doesn't matter. So um a lot of specialist intervention is needed there, but that is a real problem because the problem with that is it does, it causes so much destruction to everything it touches. It's a very real problem, absolutely. Is overcoming your addiction the hardest thing you've ever had to do? I've had to overcome many things. Yeah. You know, really, you know, you read that book and you say, I've really had the yeah. whole nine yards of it and to a very high level. Um, but yeah, that was, um, that was one of them, 
there are a few in my life, but that is certainly an yeah. unbelievable challenge to uh, overcome. If you had a young, let's just say a young guy, 18, 20, that was involved and surrounded with the wrong people today, getting up to bad, bad stuff, mm. and he said, what, what do you think about what he's doing? And how his life is, and you know, what would what would you say to to a man listening to this interview now, that's maybe in a similar position to what you were in when they were, in, you know, involved in gangs? I would say, look, you know, there are many reasons for many stuff. I mean, to get that, but the trick is, you know, you have to think about your own life and where you are going, and you have to look beyond that. All that glitters is not gold, Michael. Right? You know, and there is always so much more, and. You know, human beings are worth so much more and can aspire to so much more. I know this. They can actually be anything they want. Choose something. Really. I mean, I'm living history of that. Yeah. Thankfully, I can say that with an authority and you can say what you want. You know, the providence of it is there. Make of it what you will. But that is the truth. So when I see that, I know that we have greatness in us. One of the tricks is it's not usually the greatness, the greatness that we think it is, but that's part of the puzzle because it's for us to uncode. So there's so much more and we're worth so much more. So don't, you know, look and know there's so much more and be so much more. I guess for, for, for me, just thinking about, you know, that person that I kind of visually built in my head to ask you, what would you say to, to that person? And also from reading your book, you know, I guess the best way to, to ask this question is, um, Michael Francis, who I interviewed, in one of his other interviews with someone else, he was asked, what would you say to your younger self if he was in front of you now? And his answer was, well, nothing, because he, he wouldn't listen. So, you know, it must be so difficult through helping vulnerable people, people that are in these positions when... It's such as you've you've talked about internal demons, and it's an internal fight, and it's very difficult for to believe that someone else will understand that. It must be so difficult to help these people and and kind of drag them out of where they are, and or help them get themselves out of where they are. You see, I've got an answer for that too, Michael. <coughs> that helps, you know, in this, you know, because I've been through it, I've such an experience of it, so I can give what's helped solved it yeah. for me, right? Was no matter where we are on our journey or what we aspire to or what problems we're having, you know, I've learned to, 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 to really get that meaningful change that's worth something is we need all the elements to come together. So we need opportunity. We need timing, certainly. We need courage, you know, um, instruction maybe, maybe even intervention at that point. It's when these things come together at the right time that, that, that then there's a moment then where because we have this freedom of choice thing where we can go left or right. But you will find that when you step forward in the right way, even if you don't know, but you know it's the right way and keep taking them baby steps, this is what certainly done it for me. And you can affect unbelievable change at that. So that's something to be aware of. Do you know, one of the things that I'm always aware of is, you know, this has happened to me personally as well. When you get to a certain position or stage or you achieve something and there might be people around your circle. They're normally not inside it, but around your circle, then the impression you get is, and it's how does he have that? How did, how does he do this? Why does he have this? And they don't necessarily understand the level of work involved. Mm -hmm. And you must experience this as well because of your history and your past and, 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 you know your story is that the amount of work with on your with yourself as a family but also into the foundation the book helping people that you must never sleep i'm obsessed michael there's no there's no other way about it but i'm obsessed in the right way you can be obsessed about unhealthy things to be obsessed about something that it, it, it's definitely the trick of it right yeah. <clears throat> And, you know, people say, you know, the, this energy, I mean, where does it come from? There's a, there's a very succinct answer for that, that when you find your purpose in life with such a passion, 
and you are at that point. This is a uh, unbelievable well to draw from. It's never ending because you have such a clarity that well, makes sense, right? I mean, that's it. You know, you know, you go, you know, you're going at standing on your feet at that point anyway. It doesn't matter what happens after that. So you know, that's something. I'm definitely there with that, you know, because of the mountains, rivers and valleys I've crossed already, shall we say, right? But, yeah, so, but it is immense work. And, uh, you know, I don't have a job. I have a lifestyle, Michael. I have a lifestyle. But I love what I do. It, it is exhausting. But, look, you know, I'm a very, very grateful person. Why wouldn't I be? Yeah. Is there is there any part of the previous life, any part at all, that you miss? No. I, no, there's not. We have moments where one of the things is I, I you know, it's it, it can be hard I miss so much. I can feel I've wasted time or where I was away and, you know, I miss my children growing up and things like that. Oh, you know, you consider this. and But, you know, there's more going on here because I wouldn't be where I am if it hadn't have been where I've been. It's all relative in a sense. So, no, because it, it matters where we are and what we're doing. That's certainly where we're going more. As part of the journey to help someone survive and transition, as part of that, understanding that you can have pride in your story instead of shame pride that you survived it and not shame that you experienced it yes i mean this is another great thing because you have to remember we all get lost sometime you know you know we start as a blank sheet you know and we learn by falling down it's just as simple as that so whether it's a bad relationship really serious consequences for actions, bad choices, bankruptcy, whatever, you know, whatever. None of us are perfect. But, you know, get over yourself, really, is the thing. Because, you know, we can't be held and shouldn't be in any bondage, really. Some things are heavier than others. But it is about working your way out of that as quick as possible. And then becoming what you're meant to be on your own journey michael yeah it's surely well uh, you know i agree i i think that more often than not the the culture and world we live in is is very very self-serving but i think it's self-serving because it, in most cases it has to be to pay the bills to survive um you know and, yeah. it, and it has to be but it, yeah. it's you know, the way that you describe things in so many ways, saying, you know, the nice cars, we're borrowing this stuff. It, Absolutely. It simplifies, for me, <clears throat> it simplifies life for me so much that means that's not important. What's important is focusing on the very simple things in life, family, helping people, love, care, honesty. Do you, do you think that there is a possibility when the right people do come together that can make mass change for the better absolutely i'm with that doubt i see it all the time i see it all the time in business i see it in projects all the time and that is one of the tricks of it is we can search all our life for the right people michael really ask yourself look at your own journey you know and you'll see that this is a lifelong business populating your life with the right people and you hear everyone say i can count that the people you know on one hand if i'm lucky all right but um <clears throat> so this is one of the things in projects is when you get them synergies together in the right ways in all with all the all the right people and the skills and all that and you have a real start with the end in mind you know and you really know where you're going with that it's very hard to stop people like that in fact you won't but when, when they when they find their they find their momentum they always do very well the trick of it is getting it right at the start you work with a lot of chief execs of companies lots of different businesses how much of your work with people at that level in business is working on consulting for their business compared to working actually with them as a person uh, our center we're in different industries, you know, as you know, um, mainly media. But our, our um, central 
central business, if you want to call it that, is building national and global brands. And, you know, we bolt absolutely everything onto that. It's a fa it's very specialised now where we are with so much experience because we do it consistently and we know what works. And again, it's like, you know, it's this kind of, you know, imagine the, the safe thing. One to the right, two to the... It really is like that. It's so finite like that. This is where success and failure is. It's absolute millimetres. So it's how you put it together. And then, of course, you, you, you know, you have to nurture stuff. But this is the key of it, is, the, is, is, is knowing how to put it together, just like you do with the right people at the start, Michael. Yeah, and every safe's different, right? Bespoke, absolutely. Yeah. A lot of the formulas are the same. But it's just knowing and being able to solve the problems of why maybe that needs a bit of adjusting there. Do you ever, in your business, cons like consulting and, and working with brands and things, how, do you come across a fear of success a lot? Oh, that's a good question. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a really good question because of our programming. You know, you get people that come, they say, look, you know, I'm hitting half a million annually, but I just can't get over that. I've got a cap. What, what, what's going on? Everything I do, I can't break this. You know, I have the answers for that. This is a very internalized thing. You know, when we do work and we remove certain things in there, guess what happens and adjust a few things? That changes because it's like valleys, the different levels. You can't see over the next as you go yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fear of success is something I have experienced myself in the past as well. Um, fear of failure is something that freaks me out, but gets me working. Fear of success is, as you've described it perfectly from my own experience, it's a mental block that requires understanding and of yourself and working forward to break that down. Um, but success can be a very scary thing. Um, you certainly don't be a, seem to be afraid by it. Um, I'm not now. No, I'm not. That's a really good question. The reason why I'm not is because I've got success framed in the right way in me and my mind. And it's not a, a stupid success. Oh, I need a big house or, you know, a flash car. I mean, that's, it's just not that. It's, I, I am committed to working so hard but I get so much more beauty in my success. Yes, it's important to pay the bills and, you know, and our children are looked after, of course. But, you know, when you do good things, that will take care of itself anyway and you work hard. Why would I have to worry about that? I'm focused on other things. Yeah. I see so much more, as I said, Michael. Is there a fear? Are you feared of anything now? <laughs> we have fears but you know what i i don't you know i don't listen to fears because i know or doubts or anything like that if these things come in or they come through because i know it's rubbish and really you know there's nothing to fear but fear itself i mean it's not fear it's excitement it's important to know about these messages you know and how to work with them the purpose and the target and what we're doing and is much more important than that yeah. What type of people do you want to work with moving forward? Because there will be people that listen and listen to this and watch this that um, take a lot of value in what you say. What type of people do you feel in companies as well? Do you feel that you can help the most personally? I um I like transparent people. I like real people. I'm very I I just can't help but because I'm very intuitive and I'm very skilled obviously and I'm always looking you know behind experience in life so I um you know it's not I'm looking I can't help miss if people's character isn't right I don't like selfish people that that, that turns me off you know we all have to look after ourselves up to a point of course, of course but there are lines of this you know and there are consumers you know and there are givers you know, I, you know, I like the givers, you know, I like the givers. I like the ones who, who are, have got them, have a good providence of work. They don't have to be, you know, they can be anywhere in that scale. You know, the prerequisite being that they are real people with good hearts and they're willing to commit themselves to what they say, who they are. Yeah. 
Well, look, I, I would like to thank you for, for sharing your story with us, um, for talking about the work that you're doing now. And look, more importantly, talking about the lessons that you've learned for your experience, because everybody always enjoys a Hollywood story where they, they glamorize, and I'm talking about the viewer's perspective, they glamorize the story. You know, they see all the mafia films in America, but very rarely do they, they remember the end where it's, you know, it's really positive. So for someone to come through what you've been through and to to open up about it, um, you know, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much for spending the time with us today. Thanks for having us, Michael, really. You know, you're a wonderful person, really, and that's very, very evident in all that you do. Um, can I ask you a question? No, I've got a wonderful question to sure. ask you. I just, you know, you've, you're, you're interviewing some wonderful people your style is wonderful this is why i you know i was very happy to come on the show today thank you yeah and um you're doing wonderful work what really drives you with this you know and all the wonderful people that you're talking to what what is what is your drive and what would you really like to happen uh with your work going forward now i guess for me i've learned a lot from so many people in my life but there's two ways that I've learned from them there's there's those that have taught me how to and there's those that have taught me how not to and for me there's equal value in both one of them is a more pleasant experience than the other absolutely for me speaking to people like yourself speaking to people who have a story to share and experience it truly is about the lesson. It's not about what I call the Hollywood. And although my life and my story has been very di different to yours, I've learned a lot from you and I've learned a lot from all of the guests that I've spoken to. So for me, if I can learn so much from someone that's life is so different and far away from mine, that almost definitely means that by doing this, there will be someone else out there that watches this, that this could help. Mm. And I say this to almost every guest I speak to before the interview in a private call. If this helps one person in the world, then it's been a success. That for me is exciting, even if I never know about it. That for me is what excites me and, and, and drives me forward. It's also something I enjoy. Um, this is a passion project for me and it helps you share your message and your story to help others. And it also helps me build my passion project as well. And helping someone help people is a pretty exciting thing. A great answer, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, look, what we'll do is um, we'll make sure that everything is in the description. So those who are interested in the book, um, we will ensure that uh, they can get access to that in, in the description to this video and share that on our social media as well. Um, and also to your website um, where people can look and find out the latest news and what you're doing. Um, and I really look forward to playing a lead part in the movie when it's, when it's, <laughs> when it's being filmed, Stephen. No worries, Michael. <laughs> All right, take care. Thank you.